Good morning. Good morning. It's good to see all of you here today. Don't forget to um, sign the attendance pad, and you know about singing the hymns and the offering. Tomorrow is our last session of our fall Bible study, and I believe you have one of these handouts in your bulletins, do you? Yeah, okay, I forgot. But um, remember, if you want to uh, do this, the payment's due next Sunday. And um, the Interchurch Council Thanksgiving service is going to be virtual this year, and we're the host church, so it's going to be filmed here, and then we will post it on the different um, Facebook pages or however each church posts it. We'll post ours on Facebook on Tuesday, November 22nd at 7 p.m. Um, we may be posting it on the website, too. We'll just let you know. And we will be emailing the bulletin out prior like we did this summer, okay? And we've got a rose on the altar today. Uh, Dave and Gail Runkle put that in honor of the birth of their grandson, Christian Scott Runkle. And they're born to their son, Chris, and his wife, Emily. This is their first. You might have noticed that the Toys for Tot boxes are out here and um, downstairs. And so we are collecting that's uh, new toys, and they need to be here um, by December 13th. So you have a couple of weeks. And you should have received your pledge cards this week. Next Sunday is the Sunday that we will bring them to the altar. So either bring them with you and we'll have a time you can place them on the altar or uh, bring it by the office at another time or even um, drop it in the offering plate, whatever is best for you. Let us now continue our worship with our invocation. Let us pray. God of fall and winter, God of spring and summer, you know the seasons of our lives. Let the season of darkness and doubt pass away that we may be reborn in your light. Lead us into a season of light and warmth, a season of joy, a season of sober judgment, a season where your children clothe themselves in the breastplate of faith and hope and the helmet of hope and salvation. Help us put aside the ways of darkness and live as the children of light. Amen. Please stand for the entrance hymn.
You may be seated. Our epistle lesson this morning comes from 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verses 1 through 11. And it can be found on page 1031 in your pew Bible if you'd like to join us and, and follow along. But as to the times and the seasons, brethren, you have no need to have anything written to you. For you yourselves know well that the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. When people say, there is peace and security, then sudden destruction will come upon them as travail comes upon a woman with child, and there will be no escape. But you are not in darkness, brethren, for that day to surprise you like a thief. For you are all sons of light and sons of the day. We are, uh, we are not of the night or of darkness. So then let us not sleep as others do, but let us keep awake and be sober. For those who sleep, sleep at night, and those who get drunk are drunk at night. But since we belong to the day, let us be sober and put on the breastplate of faith and love, and for a helmet, the hope of salvation. For God has not destined us for wrath, but to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us, so that whether we wake or sleep, we might live with him. Therefore, encourage one another and build one another up, just as you are doing. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. Well, y'all get to be children today, and we might have a few children watching us on our live stream. But, um, so, all of us are good at something, but maybe not always the same thing. Perhaps it's jumping, or drawing, or spelling, or reading, or even making cookies. Perhaps you're really good at eating cookies. We all cannot be good at everything, but we can try to do the very best we can in everything we do. It's especially helpful when we do everything for God. Well, in the gospel lesson that I'm going to read later on, Jesus sees a woman put a penny in the offering plate, a penny of, of what their day and age would be be, while other people put in lots of money. But you know who Jesus said did the best they could? Was it the woman who gave the penny or the people who gave lots of money? You know, it's wonderful that people who have been blessed with riches are willing to give to help the poor and the needy and the mission of the church. But in this story, Jesus had a special place in his heart for this person who gave only a penny. Because you see, that penny was the last penny, the only penny that she had. She did her best. She gave everything she had. And when we give to others, what is important is not how much we give, but how we give from our heart. Let us pray. Dear God, help us to do the best we can in everything we do, and no matter what we do, help us to remember to do it for you. Amen. I like going down and sitting on my stool because it just gets me in the frame of I'm talking to kids. Probably this one back here too. This kid. <laughs> I, 
I have several prayer requests to share with you this morning, giving you some updates on people. I mentioned last Sunday that Nancy Huntley was in the hospital. Well, she's left the hospital, and she's now at Anson Rehab, and she's in quarantine for a while, but I hear you can go wave at her at the window. I think she's in room 33 is what I was told at one point. And Eleanor Pesci has moved to Meadowview, and she's in the same situation. She's in quarantine for a while because she just got there. But I know both of them would appreciate cards if, if you would like to do that. And continue to pray for them along with Elwood and Lib Huntley, Doris Bias, and Fred Ross Marsh. Krista has asked for prayers for her, Karen, for her cousin, Sharon Huskins, who's in her last days when you say Krista, yes. And also lifting up prayers for her school, West Rockingham Elementary. They had a sudden loss of a child, and they want to be praying because the teachers knew him, the children knew him. So please keep them in your prayers. And for all those that are fighting cancer, I know I say this each Sunday, but I don't think we can say it enough, and their families and caregivers, also those infected with COVID. The numbers are going up. So remember to wash your hands, wear your mask, and keep six feet from others. I know you heard that the restrictions of how many people in a place has been tightened, but for worship, we still have the same um, amount, so we're good. I just wanted to let you know that if somebody asked or, or if you were curious. And I have a piece of paper that's updated that has all that information. We want continued prayers. We ask for continued prayers for all those on our prayer list and also some anonymous prayers that have been shared with me. Let us go to God for prayer this morning. Great Lord, you are the giver of every good and perfect gift. From the morning sun to the evening star, our days are measured by your indescribable generosity. We confess that we find it hard at times to be thankful. So easily we allow ourselves to be distracted by greed, by pride, by desire. Teach us that contentment is not the result of what we have but is rather the result of what we believe, that we are your people and the sheep of your pasture. We pray all this and the names we have mentioned out, lo out loud and on our hearts in the name of Jesus Christ, your Son, our Savior, the one who taught his disciples to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen.
Let us pray for our offering. O Lord, you graciously pour out your blessings on us. Your gifts surround us. Despite our abundance, help us see the widow's gift, for we long to give as she did, gladly giving all she had. All we have is a gift from your hand. Help us loosen our hands, giving to the work of this church on your behalf. For in giving freely to you, we gain the opportunity to live abundant lives. In the name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, Amen. Please remain standing for the reading of the gospel. I'll be reading from the, the gospel according to Mark. It's the 12th chapter, verses 38 through 44, and you can find it in your pew Bible on page 881. And in his teaching, he said, Beware of the scribes, who like to go about in long robes and to have salutations in the marketplaces and the best seats in the synagogue and the places of honor at feasts, who devour widows' houses and for a pretense make long prayers. They will receive the greater condemnation. And he sat down opposite the treasury and watched the multitude putting money into the treasury. Many rich people put in large sums. And a poor widow came and put in two copper coins, which make a penny. And he called his disciples to him and said to them, Truly I say to you, this poor widow has put more than all those who are contributing to the treasury. For they all contributed out of their abundance. But she out of poverty has put in everything she had her whole living. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. So picture a boxer, not a dog, a boxer, beaten up and exhausted, many rounds into the grueling match. The bell rings and he collapses on a stool in the corner. With each round, his chances of winning have slipped slowly away. His opponent is just too strong, too fast. Silently, the boxer's trainer hands him a wet towel for his forehead and tends to his wounds. Then he stops and looks into his eyes. A silent agreement passes between them. The trainer picks up another towel and throws it into the ring. Enough is enough. Picture a small child riding in a supermarket cart being pushed by his mother. He's been throwing a tantrum for the past 10 minutes. The other shoppers are looking at them with annoyance. But his mother goes on with her shopping as though nothing has happened. She knows how to handle the situation. She's seen it before. Her son, who's cried himself out by now, realizes he's not getting anywhere with this tactic. So he stops 
ending his fearsome crying jag with a pathetic whimper. Enough is enough. Picture a man who's been struggling for many months with a disturbing thought. He's always enjoyed having a drink with dinner, but lately it seems that one drink has turned into two or three or so many that he's lost count. His marriage is on the rocks, his children give him disapproving glances, and his boss is threatening to fire him because he's habitually late. He's troubled by the thought that maybe he's an alcoholic. A friend of his who's in recovery himself has said just as much. He's told him about Alcoholics Anonymous and how it literally saved his life. He's given him his card and said, call me any time. The man fishes the card out of his top dresser drawer. Enough is enough. Picture a husband and wife who have reached an impasse in their marriage. For years now, they've traced and retraced the same pathways, resurrected the same tired old arguments. There seems to be no solution no way out of the logical and emotional tangle into which they've collapsed. Over the years, one or the other of them has suggested that they go to their minister for help or maybe a therapist, but each time, one of them has been unwilling. Now they look at each other, and both of them realize it's the only solution. They'll go seek help at last. Enough is enough. In countless circumstances, saying enough is enough is a good thing. It's a recognition that it's time to cease our pointless striving. It's a decision to move on. Why is it that in each of these instances, somebody's finally able to say enough is enough, but that when it comes to the accumulation of material wealth, most of us still believe the sky's the limit. You can never be too rich or too thin, said Wallace Simpson, who married King Edward VIII of England, a decision that led to his decision to abdicate the throne. Most people thinking of the deadly disease of anorexia, would disagree with the Duchess of Windsor on the too thin part. But too rich? No way. To quote a character in one of Jesus' parables, you can always build a bigger barn, right? Well, the story of the widow's might here in Mark 12 is an example of someone declaring enough is enough financially, and then finding freedom. No doubt every resident of Jerusalem who knew this impoverished elderly widow worried on her behalf, thinking that she might not have enough to live on. The first verses of this passage that I read you contain a critique by Jesus of the worldly temple authorities. In verses 38 through 40, he scolds the scribes who live an opulent lifestyle, strutting around in lavish robes and gorging themselves at banquets, even as they devour widows' houses. The story is seldom retold in full context, including this detail. You see, Jesus has just remarked, that no one should be forced to give herself poor. Even Jesus himself, it seems, thinks the widow's gift is too much rather than enough. And yet, and yet it's her decision, her desire to give herself poor. No one, not even the scribes in all likelihood, would have said this woman ought to give up the very last coin she had placing herself in abject poverty. But she does it anyway. She does it of her own volition. Strange as it may seem to our own prudent, cautious selves, 
she decides that having nothing, absolutely nothing, is enough. Literally, it isn't enough, of course. That's the irony of it all. And Jesus is brutally honest about that as he tells the tale. The mite, that tiny coin, is all this woman has to live on. By placing it in the temple collection box, the widow makes a truly sacrificial gift. Because of her remarkable generosity, she guarantees she will not have enough. And she may literally die as a result. It's akin to the decision Jesus himself will sh soon make. Just a few days from the date that he tells this parable, on this day he's teaching in the temple in relative peace surrounded by his disciples. Just a few days later, as Mark tells it, comes the agony in the garden where Jesus implored, implores, Abba, Father, for you all things are possible. Remove this cup from me, yet not what I want, but what you want. A short time after that, he will be on the cross when this happens. At three o'clock, Jesus cried out with a loud voice, Eli lo leme sabachthani, which means, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Then Jesus gave a loud cry and breathed his last. Can you hear the sound of Jesus' own might falling into the collection box? The stewardship committee of Jack Stott's church in Texas in the very early days of his ministry was opening the envelopes that contained pledge cards they'd just received at the annual campaign. When they came to the card of Mamie Cades, they were dismayed. It seemed the amount was far more than Mamie could afford. Mamie, as Jack described her years later, was a tall, homely woman who always wore threadbare dresses that looked to be decades old. She lived by herself in a house that was in terrible repair. Everyone assumed she was poor, which, by most definitions, she was. Somebody's got to talk with Mamie and tell her she can't afford this gift, one of the committee members said. She ought to keep the money. The church doesn't really need it, and she could use it to fix up her place. You go tell her, Pastor. Yeah, we get to do all the dirty work, right? Well, with some trepidation, the young and inexperienced pastor set out to do just that. He arrived at Mamie's ramshackle house and sat down in her parlor. He could hear the wind whistling through the cracks in the wall. The pastor told Miss Keynes, for he would have never dreamed of calling her by her first name in that place and time. She, he told her of the stewardship committee's concern. And a look of dismay came over her face, and she asked, Would you take my joy away from me? It was a modern-day widow's might parable. It taught Stott something valuable, that informed his later work as president of McCormick Theological Cemetery, Seminary, tasked with raising major gifts. Well, Thanksgiving Day will soon be upon us. It's an excellent opportunity for us to declare, enough is enough. When we keep the holiday well, we make that statement not out of the sense of deprivation, but rather out of deep gratitude. We look around us, we count our blessings, even if some of our blessings we might be seeing on a computer screen with a Zoom Thanksgiving with our family and friends. But we realize that yes, indeed, we have been blessed. But you see, our, poor, our possessions 
are not the source of that blessing. It's our relationship with a living, loving God. What such a God gives us in life in terms of material wealth simply has to be enough. Think about that for a moment. Think about that. Would a God whose nature is abundance give us anything less than enough? The spiritual challenge for us lies in meeting our generous God where God truly is, not where our own devices may lead us. The book of Revelation spins a colorful picture of a heavenly city that's about as far removed from the widow's might as possible. This city, God's city, is positively glittering with material wealth. The wall is built of jasper while the city is pure gold, clear as glass. The foundations of the walls of the city are adorned with every jewel and the twelve gates are twelve pearls. Each of the gates is a single pearl and the street of the city is pure gold, transparent as glass. Well, all this opulence is really beside the point. It's utterly insignificant because of the far superior glory described in the verses that follow. I saw no temple in the city for its temple is the Lord God, the Almighty, and the Lamb. And the city has no need of sun or moon to shine on it. For the glory of God is its light, and its lamp is the Lamb. Of what value are streets of glittering gold and gates of shimmering pearl in a city lit by the glory of God. Maybe the widow with her might imagined how she would walk those golden streets one day soon. And how if even she could have contrived to take that tiny coin with her, it would be utterly insignificant. To her, the only treasure worth pursuing is the glory of God. And that, for her and for us, most certainly is enough. Amen. Our closing hymn is A Charge to Keep I Have, and we're going to sing it all. Well, Emily's going to sing it all, and we're going to hum it all in our heads. next Sunday is when we bring our pledge cards. Hear this benediction. 
To the love and grace and peace of God, we commend you and all those you love, wherever they may be. As you go forth from this place, remember the generosity of the widow who gave everything that another might have something. Go and do likewise. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. <laughs>